All right, welcome everyone. I am your host, Shag Wellen Bullock, or you can call me Shaggy, and this is a trip down Stoner Drive. Now, if you haven't heard this podcast before, it is a podcast to give people a voice uh, to tell their story as a patient, as a distribution brand, musician, politician, and give them a platform to tell how cannabis has positively or even maybe negatively impacted the, their life. Uh, it's a way to give you a behind the scenes of the industry or the culture around cannabis. Uh, today, I am so ecstatic to interview my biggest guest so far, Jesse Channon, who is the CGO or Chief Growth Officer of Columbia Care. Thank you so much, Jesse, for being on my show, and if you could give people a little bit of your background. Hey, so excited to be here, Shaggy. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name's Jesse. I'm the Chief Growth Officer at Columbia Care, which means I get the opportunity to work with a lot of incredible people across the country in about 17 states where we have operations. Um, we're a vertically integrated uh, operator, so we uh, cultivate, manufacture, distribute, and ultimately through retail and wholesale, uh, bring our products to patients and recreational customers uh, across the country and even into the EU. Um, been with the company for about three years now uh, in, in this capacity, um, and prior to this, I was in technology, so uh, early on in social media and ad tech, uh, spending the better part of a decade on Madison Avenue, I'm um, working in a couple of startups there. So that's that's the, the quick version on me. Oh, that's amazing. Um, so you're saying your past experience has been in uh, tech and stuff, and you see with the cannabis industry growing, there's a lot of people coming from different industries, either real estate, scientists, uh, technology. Uh, so what kind of intrigued you uh, into the cannabis industry or to Columbia Care? Yeah, so, I mean, I'll, I'll sort of, I'll, I'll bifurcate it, right? I'll break it into two things. So what interested me about the industry as a business, and then obviously separate conversation, what interested me about cannabis. Um, so as a business, I think to your point, what you're seeing is a lot of people coming into the space from varying backgrounds. But I would say the connective tissue um, that, that sort of brings a lot of those people together is a, a healthy sort of uh, appetite for risk, um, but also maybe previous experience in uh, industries or spaces that went through incredible chaos or, or, or rapid hyper growth, right? And I know for a lot of my friends and myself who came from backgrounds in social or marketing technology, ad tech, um, we saw and experienced some parallels to this industry in that space, right? So Facebook went from a platform where your your mom, you know, where you were trying to find a, a, a hookup in college to then your mom playing Farmville all day to then, you know, becoming the biggest social platform on the planet and fundamentally changing the way people communicated with each other. And I think what we see in cannabis is something very similar. So you have this core of very passionate uh, consumers and producers who are now bringing that to a mainstream, more normalized audience where so much of what we do, and Shaggy, you probably know this as well, if not better than, than most, so much of what we do as a business is very nascent. We're still figuring a lot of stuff out as we go, um, but we're serving an enormous amount, $25 billion plus market of consumers and patients. That unbalanced equation, I think, attracts a lot of you know crazy people who, who love the chaos and love and thrive in that sort of growth environment. And I, I put myself firmly in that uh, in that audience of people who are uh, probably uh, too addicted to sort of growth and, and chaos in business. Absolutely. I love that you kind of almost say crazy because it is. It's uh, like in other industries and stuff, people will, um, they will be, uh, they're kind of only in the industry because that's what they grew into where cannabis, you have a few people into it, but most of the people are into it because this is what we love. Like there's no yeah. other industry we'll be a part of. And you see people working harder um, and just way, willing to put in more and do way more even on the side uh, to be in this industry, which I love about it. Um, so with your past, uh, how do you think your experience in marketing and online presence has helped elevate uh, Columbia or cannabis since you've come on? Yeah, I, you know, I think coming from my background, I probably had a slightly different lens to some of the challenges that we were facing as a company and as an industry as a whole, um, then maybe if you came from like a big company or a CPG background, right? The, the lens that I really sort of tried to bring to it was that that scrappy startup mentality of finding gaps, right, in the customer journey or in the sort of the business overall, and then trying to build 
interesting or compelling tools to fill that gap. So things like Forage, right, that we have as a company or, um, you know, virtual.care and all of these other things that we've done. It's really technology that was very purpose built. It was meant to solve a very specific sort of narrow issue that we saw that we felt was limiting either the education or the engagement of our customer and patient base. Um, so I think that combined with, again, embracing that pace that it takes to succeed in a hyper growth industry, I think maybe less specific to marketing and ad technology, but more just sort of coming from a startup after startup background, that's sort of the norm, right? Like it's, mm -hmm. you're just used to having to make decisions and balance a lot of these disparate tasks on a daily basis is sort of, you know, it just feels a little bit more normal than other people who are coming in from outside of that going, well, wait a second, this is like, it's bizarre, right? That the the pace that we're operating with in this industry. So I think that I was I was well conditioned, as you can tell, as an athlete, um, coming from those those former startup days, long days and long nights, to to really sort of embrace what we've had to do as an industry over the last few years to to continue to succeed. Absolutely. Now, um, I think your background, especially in startup companies, has given you a lot of chance to you have to react and you have to adapt. Um, but coming into the space, what is one moment that you might have struggled or a moment you learned uh, coming into the industry that you were not expecting? Oh, man, I, I can tell you that I've struggled and learned almost every day that I've been here. I'll be the first to admit it. Um, sometimes I literally look back on the week that we've just had and I'm like, I had no idea what I was doing. Like, hey, we're just we're making it up as we go. Right. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the learnings, I think the thing that took me back most, right, that I was so just there was two things that stick out to me that were like, wow, I didn't see that coming. One, the complexity of the marketing supply chain, the things we are not allowed to do as an industry, which creates an, an enormous amount of complexity on a state by state, region by region basis to how we do everything from communicating with our customers to designing in-store experiences, technology, packaging, all of that. The, the regulatory hurdles and, and compliance that exists in this space is incredible right like it's insanity oh absolutely. um that and the science that goes into cultivation and manufacturing in the space um i think if you are you know even someone who has let's say been around uh the the plant and our you know our industry let's say for a while um to see the level of sophistication that we as an organization and other organizations like us have when it comes to growing and getting the most out of these plants and manufacturing some of the best products that are available in the world is incredible to see. Like I have little to no domain expertise in that area, but mm -hmm. watching people like Eric Culberson, right, who's our head of, of horticulture or cultivation at Columbia Care, um, and Sherry and his team members watching what they do as they walk into these grows and optimize the environmental controls and nutrient programs and watering and everything else that goes into giving us the best possible things to consume has been amazing like <laughs> it was an incredible learning curve oh absolutely i mean uh for myself i just started growing for the first time this year and just knowing the little bit of differences of humidity keeping it between certain levels and then when you water you don't want to get the water on all the uh, leaves you want to get underneath and you want to feed the soil more than you're feeding the plants and it's just crazy um but beforehand you're talking about kind of the restrictions on the regulatory market or even marketing, um, cannabis is in multi-states and with all these states having different rules or regulations, it's almost like an international company. Uh, so when you're creating new marketing ideas and coming up with ideas, is there a way to keep track of which states you can use it in, like a tier system, or how do you keep track of that? Yeah, it's 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 very difficult, right? I mean, it's, it's a... Um, it's, it's an incredibly complex, like I said, supply chain to understand what it is that we can and can't do in every market. Um, we are blessed to have a really good regulatory and compliance team internally, um, led obviously all the way up by our GC, uh, David Soroli, through uh, the rest of that team, Tatiana and team. They, they're incredible, so they keep the wheels on the bus. Um, but then beyond that, we also look to partners in technology, so places like Canaregs and others that give us real-time information into what we can and cannot do sometimes down to the individual municipality in these in these states that we serve i think your example of it being a multinational company 
is probably the most accurate thing possible, right? We have, you know, in our case, 17 sovereign nations across the United States that operate in a way where uh, products and genetics and a number of other things can't cross state lines, um, where you have things like delivery considerations and packaging and retail considerations and all of these different complexities um, that don't exist in other markets that we get the joy, right, of, of mm -hmm. having to navigate. So it is. It's a multinational company inside the United States that is also multinational because we operate in the EU, which is fascinating. So, uh, yeah, and we were talking about some of the brands and that we've created in the uh, flower. What is probably your favorite house brand or one of the house brands that you love? Okay, so uh, it's it's a great question, and it's funny because Seed and Strain was the first real brand that we built right at mm -hmm. Columbia Kingdom. Um, and it has a special place in my heart, but we just did classics as a national launch. It's such a fun brand um, that the tins uh, that, uh, you know, the product comes in. I love there's a lot of care that went into creating that packaging. Um, so I, I would say, look, I, I, it's you don't have a favorite kid, right? You do, um, but you don't have a favorite kid. Uh, I, I would say I love all of our brands. Um, but classics probably has a special place in the heart right now because it's so centered around culture and music. Um, and the strains that are going into it right now are a lot of fun. Like some of them are throwbacks to, you know, strains that like my dad was joking around me the other day. And uh, there's the University of Colorado at Boulder guys. You can take that guess, right? Go Buffs. Um, and uh, he was literally asking me if we grow and I won't out him because what he asked, I was like, no one's grown that in 20 years. Um, but he was literally asking if we still grow certain things. And when I showed him the the roster of some of the strains that are in classics, he recognized half the names. That's a really interesting moment. Uh, I'm actually really glad you brought up classics because actually that is the oh. house brand that I brought on. So it is our pre-roll packs that is in a cassette, um, which is amazing. It's so fantastic. People love it. And then when you open it up, you got the nice little pre-rolls, so perfect good. to go. So um, I got the Sour Diesel. I figured a nice sativa was going to go. Sour uh, perfect. Diesel. Exactly. And what I love about classics is cannabis has been around for thousands and thousands of years. And I like all these new strains that are coming out, but we don't have to get rid of the old strains. The old strains are still great. So we keep it classic, keep it good. And then, you know, it's amazing. And people will buy it. It is flies off our shelf because people are like jack hair blue dream sour diesel uh we haven't gotten a little bit but the granddaddy perp or northern lights yeah. those i mean just flew off our shelves because people want the classic strains as well listen so i uh while you're lighting up um and as a disclaimer for everyone who knows where i live i will not be consuming on the podcast today because i'm in a non-consumption state um sour diesel man is a top five that's a top five rotation for me regardless Right. Like, sure, there are incredible crosses out. And, you know, you brought up Jack, like J4 and some of these other things that are out there are incredible. Um, but I'm a sativa guy and it's tough to beat. You know, lemon sour diesel is still a, a go to favorite for sure. So, um, yeah, I think that is part of the appeal of classics. Right. Seed and Strain is a very curated brand where we really do bring a lot of those crosses and a lot of the new genetics that are out there. Um, that are incredible high testers or like really, really interesting terpene profiles and stuff. You'll see a lot of that show up in that brand. Classics is meant for the workhorses. And I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. We should not lose the things that got us to where we are today just because there are there are some new really cool things that are coming out. Exactly. Um, now, recently, uh, there was big news that uh, Columbia Care has been acquisitioned or acquired by Cresco. Um, yeah. Being one of the bud tenders in the dispensary, uh, we're all wondering, is there any big changes to come either into the dispensary or on a national level? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, TBD, right? I mean, not trying to dodge the question, but I think there is just fun. so much to be determined. It's a massive integration, right? I can tell you that as part of the management team, we spoke with a number of potential partners that would be a great opportunity to merge with or acquire or be acquired by. And what stuck out about the Cresco team, it starts all the way at the top with Charlie and flows down through that organization. It's an incredible culture that I think is very, very similar to the culture that we've built and the way that we try to operate internally. Um, there's a huge focus on people. There is an incredible process with regards to quality 
for their products and their brands. There's a level of thoughtfulness in everything that they do. They leverage technology to try to enhance customer journeys and experiences. Um, we fit together when you look at the map, we fit together really well as sort of a puzzle, right? Um, they are one of the largest wholesalers of product in the country. We're one of the largest retailers of product in the country. It's just an incredible synergy. Um, for the team members that are, you know, in operations, right? So in cultivation, manufacturing and, and dispensary, I don't see a whole lot changing anytime soon, right? I think both organizations are very, very proud of the way that things are run. And I think we've got really, really good operations. So I don't think there's, there's necessarily big things that are coming as far as changes there. Um, could there be changes over time? Sure. I think it'll be for the better though, because I, I think that the way in which this combined organization is thinking about talent is thinking about um, experiences for the customers. It's it, it should create one of the better environments to be in as a team member. Absolutely, and I I love hearing that as a team member because um, working in I've been in the industry for five years, uh, but working in the uh, for cannabis has been a great opportunity. Um, you guys have treated even down to the bud tenders really well. Uh, with samples, with transparency is a big thing. We're constantly getting uh, updates on newsletters and things going on with the company. Um, so I just really love the way you guys do treat us and empower us as well. So uh, that was the biggest question is when you guys were being acquired is we were just hoping that things would kind of uh, stay the same, but uh, uh, progress, of course. Yeah, um, I, think, I think that'll be the case. Absolutely. So now down to the hard hitting questions. Oh boy, okay. Do you have a favorite stoner movie? Whoa, uh, this is, so this is a big ask. Um, I mean, are we defining stoner movie as in central theme to the, to the movie? Half-baked, duh, obviously, no question. Um, Dave Chappelle is a genius and early Chappelle is just as good as Chappelle these days, right? Um, so I, I'll go half-baked there. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll just stick there. I think that, that that's a classic. That's tough to beat. No, good answer. Very good answer. Um, and then the other hard-hitting questions, I have three of them. The Let's second go. one is, what is your favorite artist or genre of music? Oh, not a fair question. Um, I grew up in a household that really embraced music, right? And that has sort of come through. My brother's an artist. Um, it's come through to my son. My son is very into music. He's three and a half. He loves music. It's a huge part of his life. So I don't think that I can give you an individual um, artist. But I'll tell you what I'll, I will tell you the the reoccurring playlist that I play with my son. Right. OK. So yes. when we do nighttime, Everett and I, we listen to music together. And some of the some of the sort of repeat hitters on there is going to be the Beatles, uh, Bob Dylan. Dan Morrison and Elton John. So like those are four artists that are somewhat eclectic, right? Like very different, um, but that my son can pick out at three and a half, can pick out by name. If he hears a Beatles song, he'll be like, that's the Beatles. And that's a proud, proud dad moment. So th that's the roster. No, I, I love that because I was glad it wasn't pop or anything like that. It was beautiful <laughs> classics, all, all great artists. Yep. So gr fantastic. And then the last of the hard hitting ones is when you do consume, what yeah. is one of your favorite foods to consume? Oh man, so I did an interview. I've got so much shit about this the last two weeks. I did an interview with the Clio Awards, Clio Muse, and they just posted it and they outed me because they asked, like one of the questions was, you know, what's a go-to? And I'm like, South Park and Munchkins from Dunkin' Donuts, obviously. And they, pr they, they printed it. Um, so I will say, I gotta stay consistent. I do love my Munchkins as, probably shouldn't as much as I do. Um, but I also love savory food. And so I would say chicken parm has got to be like the go to savory dinner. That's that's tough. That's a tough one to beat. No, I love it. You know, you got yeah, your like snack food, like late night and or yeah. early morning. And then you got like the real true savory. So I do enjoy those answers. Um, now, uh, when somebody comes into the dispensary, um, what I really like is a lot of us, we're not trying to say, oh, you should get this, you should get that. Uh, my biggest question is, why are you in here? What are you yeah. looking for? Tell me about you. Uh, before you tell me what product you're looking for, tell me why are you using it? And so um, that's my question to you. Why do you use cannabis? Yeah, um, just a, a quick sort of note on that. 
listening to your conversations, meaning the teams in the more mature markets and how you guys approach very consultative um, those those engagements with customers and with patients is exactly why Forage is built the way that it is. So if you go on forage.io and you go through that process, the first question is, how do you want to feel today? Not what do you want to use? And and it once you go through a couple of those contextual questions, the last thing is we ask, what are you comfortable using, right? Because to me, it's about the outcome, not the product, right? Um, so I guess to get back to your question, why do I consume? Why do I use? Um, I think like many during the pandemic, my usage of the product has probably evolved a bit. Um, I dealt with a lot of anxiety and a lot of uh, issues sleeping, not only just between work, but also what, what's been going on in our world, right? And having a young son and watching him try to develop in a time where it, it was tough to get him around other people, other friends, you know, you want to get him into preschool. There was just a lot going on. And then everybody crammed at home together, right? Working from home. I'm in my basement right now. So like yeah. all of these things combined, I think presented a new level of stress onto our mental health. For me, I use THC, I won't say too frequently because I live in Georgia. Um, I use it very frequently as a way to unwind at the end of the night and to get a good night's sleep. To me, that is one of the most fundamental use cases to the product for me now at this stage in my life, which is very different than the way that I would have used the product you know, 15 years ago. It was a, a, a very different use case. Um, so, but right now it brings me a lot of comfort. It helps me to sort of take the edge off and, and honestly helps me get a full night's sleep, which was difficult during the pandemic. Absolutely. And I think sleep is the biggest one that we see in our patients. Uh, most of them are coming in for edibles and you even see a lot of the, uh, moms or grandmas or, uh, things like that. Usually people over 50, like, uh, even my actually next door neighbor, uh, it was a really great story, but during Christmas time, her grandma granddaughter gave her a little gummy and she had the best sleep of her life so she came into the store not realizing I worked there and I saw her and I was just like hey how's it going and now we're really good neighbors really connected I call her I text her I'm like hey your gummies are in you can come in and grab them um, and it's all just because of cannabis and it helped her together so like it went from just uh, hey how's it going to actually becoming really good and connected uh, from a gummy so it's just fantastic uh, which I love yeah, um, I mean, look, sh sh shout out to federal regulatory reform. Um, I, I, I would dare you to find a more diverse consumer base than cannabis right now for people who are integrating it into their life to help with health and wellness, to help with sleeping, to help with mental health, to have some fun, substitute for Chardonnay, no hangover, hashtag sales pitch. Um, they, like there is, there's so many reasons, right, for a product that is fundamentally so much more gentle than other things that we integrate into our life on a daily basis um, to be more normalized, to be more like that story of, you know, a state like California where your neighbor can hit you up and say, hey, what's new? Like, I'd love to try something new, which is not the case in the majority of states that we, we serve. So, No, unfortunately not. Um, and then talking about the states that we serve and the states we're in, um, one thing I've been, like I said, I've been in the industry for a while and I've traveled to different dispensaries, being a brand manager, tour companies, things like that. And I really love the grab and go or grocery store feel that we have at the dispensary in San Diego. Um, is this something that you think will be replicated in other stores uh, once we can, or do we want to give it a different feel? Uh, what is your thought on that process? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I think that this is one of the difficulties. So let's take the regulatory out of it. Let's assume that all states allowed for open retail and a similar experience to what we could do in a location like San Diego, which is not the case, right? So that's yeah. a huge limiting factor in the way that we build dispensaries and, and merchandise them. Um, but let's take all that out and let's assume that regulatory is done, right? We're in a normalized world. Um, and now we can design any experience that we want. I think our industry has a tough task ahead of it because we have buyers and we have shoppers. And right now in uh, mature markets like California and Colorado and others, we over index for buyers. We over index for a lot of people who come in, they know what they want, they grab what they want, right? And they leave, which is sort of that, that shop and go model that you were talking to. In other states where they are more emerging markets, where you're gonna have conversion from a medical program to an adult use recreational, Oftentimes, there's a desire for a little bit more of a shopping experience. 
And so we have to find that healthy balance of building really comfortable retail environments that are focused on education, that allow for people to explore and learn more about the products, while also providing, you know, sort of express lanes and, and online ordering and self-serve in-store ordering, which creates a easier transaction for people to just want to buy. Like, I don't want to come in and learn more today. I know that I just want to grab a pack of pre-rolls, classics pre-rolls and get out because I got stuff to do. Um, so we try to find that balance. Um, but I think it's a little bit different in the markets east of the Mississippi versus west of the Mississippi right now when you see the, the maturity and the education level of the consumers. All right. Was that, was that Scooby or which? which uh, Riley, Scooby? so the little Riley. one or my scrappy do. So I do have, yeah. uh, she was not planned, uh, or now I can add this part back in. But yeah, so uh, Riley was making a little bit of noise. Uh, she was not planned, but she is my scrappy dude. I've had her for 10 years. Uh, Scooby, I adopted about three years ago. Um, and so she was planned to be a part of the theme. Uh, my name is Shagwell and parents were hippies and uh, I'm a European mutt or mix. Uh, and so I don't know how they came up with the name, but I was always called Shaggy. And so eventually I was just like, I'm in the canvas industry. I, I need my Scooby. And then hopefully eventually this podcast will be out of a travel studio, out of the mystery machine, uh, and going to every state, every event, and interviewing people and doing smoke spot videos, munchy spot videos, interviews like this in person. Amazing. I think, I think it'll happen, man. Put it in the universe, it'll happen. Absolutely. All right. Um, so to get back more into um, the online and the social media, uh, marketing and things like that. Uh, a lot of social media platforms have uh, restrictions on cannabis. Um, so how do you determine which platform to put uh, your res resources in to market? Yeah, so look, it's, we do sell a federally illegal drug, right? Um, and so the, the reality is we are limited in the things that we can do. Luckily, we can leverage pretty much all the social platforms to an extent for organic. What we can't do is buy advertising. Right. And that that's OK, but it does put a huge hindrance on some of the things that we could do versus what other advertisers, classical CPG companies can do, because that opportunity for really efficient one to one advertising in those walled gardens isn't available. So when it comes to resources, we try to put a lot of resources around the creative and the content. Right. So make really interesting, compelling content that showcases the product or the locations or whatever we can do based on regulatory in a really sort of uh, inspiring way that people will engage with because we can't buy the looks. So you've got to really get out there and you have to test messaging and you have to test content and creative to try to drive engagements organically on social. Um, it's tough. We do buy programmatic advertising where available through compliant publishers uh, online. So we do get some aspect of digital that we can pay for, but for the most part, it's make good stuff and hope that people engage with it organically and that's instagram is probably one of the larger platforms um where you'll see that strategy for us and you say uh, content creation a lot in that um i wanted to get into the growth of content creators or influencers has been uh increasing tremendously over the uh, last few years what may a content creator or influencer do to kind of separate themselves in your eyes to grab attention of a company like yourself yeah, that's, so that's a great question, and I'm, I'm watching, right? So just for any content creators and influencers out there who may listen to this, I'm watching. I can't sponsor you right now because we can't do paid promotion on social. There will be a time when that changes, and companies will look for um, influencers who have created authentic relationships with their followers. I don't care if you have 1,000 followers or 100,000 followers, okay? the the engagement with that community and the authentic relationship with that community is the single most important thing for me as a brand to you as an influencer so that my advice for up and coming influencers create content that resonates with your audience in a way that they want to engage back um but that there's also a very sort of trusting authentic relationship there um when we run reporting and we look at your previous content I can spot pretty quickly whether or not someone's been buying followers or is talking to a audience that isn't listening, right? Um, so stay true to yourself. Uh, build authentic content that you would want to consume yourself, that others who are consuming it are excited to engage back 
and to provide feedback to you. And those engaged audiences will drive real opportunities for sponsorship. I absolutely love that, that you're not going for just the most views, but you're going with people that will represent your brand uh, like their own because they're just staying true to themselves. So you're finding people that would be true to your brand as well. Um, and I, I really enjoy that because I think that's probably the biggest thing is uh, right now a lot of people in our culture look down on corporations or look at them as a bad thing. And I think yeah. what we can do in cannabis is show that corporations don't have to be a bad thing. That we can show, even though we're growing bigger and more and more in states and more available to other people, but we can give back to the community. We can do good in our community and show we're not all about the money, even though it is a sales business and everything it is going to increase, but showing that we give back to the community that we're a part of. And that's, I think, helps build that bridge. Um, to even the people that uh, don't like cannabis. I mean, I think people have changed their views even if they were fully against it and they might not consume, they are okay with it because they're seeing the uh, benefits from it. Um, so we've talked a lot about restrictions and laws and um, things like that, especially in the marketing. Is there any laws uh, or policies that has really restricted you or um, any laws that you would like to change? I mean, there's there's a lot of laws I'd like to change. Um, I, let's let's start with the one that I think is probably the most feasible and the easiest to get to, um, which is safe banking. Right? Um, our industry needs comprehensive uh, reform. Right? So there are a lot of people who are incarcerated right now for doing something that now a lot of us do legally. That that has to change. There are communities that have been disproportionately affected by the war on crime that need to have some level of consideration and some sort of guaranteed participation and benefit out of an industry, again, that is disproportionately affected them, like colors of community in major cities, right? Um, communities of color, excuse me, I think I'm going to say colors of community, but um, that has to change, right? The easiest one, though, that is not a bridge too far, that everyone in this country agrees on, that we cannot seem to get through from a, a government point of view, is safe banking which is basically saying companies which are sort of forced to operate in cash, which creates security concerns, it creates logistical concerns, it creates issues paying people for their services, um, massive disruptions in supply chain uh, from an AP and AR point of view. Um, U.S. companies who operate in the U.S. are publicly traded in Canada versus the Canadian companies which are publicly traded on our major exchanges in the U.S., right? Having a instrument that fixes that and providing some level of tax reform, not just tax reform to benefit the corporations by removing some of that, but to benefit the consumer. In so many states across the country, we would be at par with below or just slightly above the cost of gray market products or black market products that would be coming from a regulated, uh, facility that you have an enormous amount of trust of what you're putting into your body, third party lab tested, everything, legal cannabis, right? If we remove so many of these issues, we could provide these products to customers and patients at a level that is incredibly affordable and very approachable to where you're no longer having to make choices about where are you buying that product from. I can't afford to buy it regulated, so I'm buying it from a less trustworthy supplier. That's bizarre that we're having to have that conversation in 2022 in this country right now. So these are products that people are using as medicine, using for health and wellness. They're things that go into your body. They need to be tested. They need to be safe. Having some changes from a regulatory point of view to even level the playing field in both taxation as well as safe banking will go a long way to providing those products. Well, thank you so much. I mean, that was an incredible answer and it's absolutely what we need to do. And like we say, we're not trying for look or looking for special treatment. We just want to be treated like any other industry so we can just regulate like any other business would. Uh, well, Jesse, uh, do you have any questions for me or want to get a bud tender's uh, perspective? Uh, you know, that's so, yeah, I'll throw one out at you. So one of the things that, um, we see, right, obviously, and again, if you're not an everyday consumer of the product, um, you're seeing a lot around uh, things like live resin right now, right, as they're making their way into markets um, east of the Mississippi. Live resin is obviously a, a different expression of the product than something like just a distillate vape pen, right? So coming from an experienced 
bud tender coming from someone who is an appreciator of the plant. Um, what would be your 30 second pitch to someone about uh, the difference or the benefits of uh, trying something like a live resin pen, like an amber pen versus just one of our distillate uh, bits? Absolutely. So uh, this is perfect. I love doing this. So uh, the difference between a distillate and a live resin is a, dist a distillate is to get you high and a live resin is to use your high. What I mean by that is a distillate is going to have high amounts of THC and it's going to have a good amount of flavor, but you're really not going to notice the difference between a sativa, a hybrid, and an indica. The live resin, they're trying to get the terpenes, which are the smell, the taste, but most, in most importantly, the effect uh, from the plant. So it's the other cannabinoids which really drives the effect from a sativa hybrid indica, not the THC. Uh, one of my coworkers, I had to give credit, credit to Frank, uh, gave me this analogy, but it's kind of like comparing Sunny D to orange juice. They're kind of the same, but not really. One tastes good, and the other's got all the nutrients and everything you want. So that's the big difference of why you're buying a live resin compared to a distillate. So I can tell you that the last 30 seconds that you just heard on this podcast of Shaggy talking about the products is 100% the reason why when we rebranded to Cannabis, the name on the door is named after the people inside because I will put our people up against anyone else in the industry when it comes to our education internally and the care in which we try to deliver um, you know, sort of consultative product recommendations to our patients and customers. When we decided to rebrand and change that name on the retail, we knew that we wanted to call our people like Shaggy cannabis because we said that is what the epitome, right? A cannabis is like the name for a scientist and an artist of cannabis all wrapped up into one. That's a sommelier of weed. That's what a cannabis is, what you just heard. And we said, ship it, man. Let's just put it on the door as well so people know exactly what they're getting when they walk in. So if you want to hear more like that, you go to the cannabis in San Diego and, and hit up Shaggy and he'll tell you all about it. Exactly. And I might be one of the most knowledgeable, but honestly, every single person in there is extremely knowledgeable. I've been at other dispensaries and you have two to three knowledgeable bud tenders and the rest kind of work there because it's fun. At a cannabis, all of us, this is our passion. This is our industry and we're not going anywhere else. This is uh, uh, what, we, what we do and what we love. And so that's why I love it. We love the science behind it and we love to break down the science for you guys so it's easier to understand. Um, well, again, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic interview. Um, make sure you follow my YouTube, Shag Wellens Way. Um, I have smoke spots video, there's munchies, but then most importantly, it's interviews like this that I think will help grow our industry, the culture, and everything behind it. Um, and then also go to gocannabis.com to find all of our locations. We are in multiple spots. Uh, Jesse, thank you again. And do you want to tell anybody maybe where to find you or anything else you'd like to say? Uh, I mean, you, you can find me in my basement. So anytime, shoot me a message and I'm happy to chat. Um, and no, I just thank you so much. Um, you know, this is this connection literally spawned from me getting the opportunity to come in and check in on the team at Cannabis um, last, the other week. Got to hang out with the team, got to meet Shaggy. Shaggy said, I got a podcast, and I said, hey, I'm on it. So um, thank you for everything that you guys do. Uh, and excited to get back out there and visit with you guys here in a couple months. Awesome. Thank you so much.